On December 21, 1988, a bomb destroyed Pan Am Flight 103 shortly after taking off from London's Heathrow Airport. All 259 people on board were killed, as well as 11 residents of the town of Lockerbie, Scotland, when debris from the plane rained down from the sky. A beautiful memorial garden has been established at a cemetery just outside of Lockerbie. The Caretakers College serves as a visitor center for those visiting the memorial gardens. Their accommodations in Sterling were quite modest and did not include a breakfast. However, they were quite pleasant and close to all the areas we wanted to visit in the Sterling vicinity. Stirling Castle is one of the largest and most important castles in Scotland. Sitting atop Castle Hill and protected on three sides by steep cliffs, it controls a major crossing of the River Forth. The current castle has structures dating from the 14th to 18th centuries. Before union with England, Stirling Castle served as a royal residence for Scottish kings and queens. The castle has played a prominent role in Scottish history, particularly during the wars with England. Parking is provided on the old esplanade that served as a military parade ground in the 19th century. There is a statue of Robert the Bruce looking towards Benockburn, where he defeated the English in 1314. To the left of the Bruce Monument, you can see the William Wallace Monument far across the valley. It marks the spot of Wallace's camp overlooking Stirling Bridge, where he defeated the English in 1297. The visitor's entrance to Stirling Castle is through this guard room square. After passing through the gates at Guardroom Square, you enter the castle proper through the forework shown here. It was erected by James IV in 1506 and originally was twice as tall as seen today. Offering very little protection, the forework was probably more for show than defense. Outside and to the left of the forework, is the Bowling Green's Garden, which is also known as Queen Anne's Garden. Below the Queen Anne Garden is a second garden called the King's Knot. This was a formal garden added in the 16th century. Outside and to the right of the forework, is an elevated section of wall overlooking the French Spur. The French Spur was a cannon emplacement added in the 1550s. From these battlements, you can see that defenders had a 360 degree view of any approaching enemy. Most of these outer defensive structures were added in the 18th century to allow for cannon emplacements. Passing through the forework, you enter an open courtyard called the Outer Close. Straight ahead is the Great Hall, built by James IV in 1503. Its golden color is known as the King's Gold, and is probably close to the original color of the buildings in the castle. The hall was the largest secular space in medieval Scotland. Inside the Great Hall, the impressive hammer beam roof is a modern reconstruction made from 400 local oak trees. These two individuals with Scottish ancestry tried to usurp the throne while visiting the Great Hall. To the right of the Great Hall is a building that enclosed the kitchen area which fed all the residents of the palace. To the left of the outer close is the first Renaissance palace built in England. It was completed in 1540, shortly before the death of James V. 
The ground floor of the royal palace is made of two apartments, one each for the king and queen. Each apartment has a hall, a presence chamber, and a bed chamber. The architecture is French in style, while the decorations are styled after German castles. The most impressive feature in the palace is the ceiling of the king's presence chamber. It is decorated with 56 wood medallions that are copies of the originals. 38 original medallions survive and are on display in another area of the palace. The chapel royal lies at the far end of the inner close. The original chapel, in which Queen Mary was crowned in 1543, no longer exists. This newer chapel was built in 1594 to christen Prince Henry, the son of James VI. Behind the Chapel Royal lies the Douglas Gardens. Tradition has it that James II murdered the 8th Earl of Douglas and disposed of his body near this spot. The Nether Bailey lies at the far northern end of the castle. Surrounded by defensive walls, this area contains a 19th century guardhouse and gunpowder stores, as well as the modern tapestry studio. Leaving the castle and walking downhill into town, we stopped for a visit at Argyle's lodging. This was a 17th century townhouse built for the Earl of Stirling and later the Earls of Argyle. It is considered to be the best example of a Renaissance townhouse. The next morning we drove to the village of Col Ross, about 30 minutes down the Firth of Forth. The town flourished in the late 16th century from coal mines dug under the river. It was cold and raining the day of our visit, and not much was happening. We did enjoy a good tea with scones before returning to Stirling. In the afternoon, we visited the Bannockburn battlefield that was just up the road from our cottage. The Scots, under the leadership of Robert the Bruce, defeated the English led by Edward II at this location in 1314. There is not much at the battlefield itself other than a statue of Robert the Bruce and a memorial to those killed in the battle. However, the visitor center has a multimedia computer-generated recreation of the battle in which visitors engage in decision-making gaming moves that determine the outcome of the battle. <laughs>